I ask the member for Kelowna Mission to lead the House in prayer or reflection. Thank you. Holy God, our hearts come to you with gratitude for our beautiful province, incredible resources, and extraordinary people. Please bring us healing and health, wisdom and unity, and a positive vision to see beyond what is just in front of us. Amen. Introductions by members. Member for Kootenai East. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it gives me great sadness to announce today the passing of one of BC Curling's great stars. And from Fruitvale was a curling mainstay in BC's interior and across Western Canada for decades. Paul was a fierce competitor, uh, hailing from Manitoba. He traversed the curling world, skipping in two briars, one for Alberta and one in BC, and moon, losing numerous finals. As mentioned, as a first fierce competitor to anyone he played against, he was also a great mentor for anyone he, anyone he played with. My, cur my personal curling experience with Paul was that his team of Dean Horning, Don Freshy, and Grant Fines were my very first memories of the Kootenai rivalry between the East and West Kootenays. Even in opposition, Paul taught me a lot, mostly how to lose. With his Manitoba tuck delivery and his old straw broom, Paul will be remembered for his tenacity and extreme confidence. His confidence was so strong that in the rare event that you would win a game, Paul would quickly correct you in the lounge after the match on how you actually lost. He simply was never defeated. Paul's passing during this week's Briar event is complimentary to the life he dedicated to and inspired others to follow. On behalf of myself and the riding of Kootenai East, I extend my sincere condolences to Marnie, Paul's family, and many friends. The curling world has truly lost a legend. Rest in peace, my friend. Member for Langley East. Mr. Speaker, I would just like to take a moment to introduce Dr. Madeline DeLittle from my riding. She is the recipient of the 2021 Canadian Counseling and Psychotherapy Association's Counselor Practitioners Award. Would the House please join me in congratulating her? Madam Clerk. Introduction of bills. Statements by members. Member for Richmond North Centre. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. I hope that most, if not all, members of this house have visited Vancouver's historic Chinatown at one point or another in your careers. Those of us that have will undoubtedly remember the colourful Leon sign by the Millennium Gate on Panda Street, a sign that is as synonymous with our Chinatown community as any landmark in Chinatown, Jack Chow Insurance. Born in Cumberland, BC, Jack Chow established his iconic place of business more than 50 years ago. A business that stood as an example of his sharp business mind, his ability to think outside the box, and above all, his kindness, generosity, and community spirit. Born in 1962, Jack saw an opportunity to transform a slender strip of commercial property into a welcoming business for Vancouver's Chinese community. At less than five feet wide on the inside, Jack's unique foresight and quick to utilize space earned his new insurance brokerage a spot in the Guinness Book of World Records as the thinnest and shallowest commercial building in the world and earned it the nickname, The Slender on Panda. Jack's brokerage brought worldwide attention to Vancouver's ribbon Chinatown, and most importantly, helped Jack carry out his goal of helping countless members of our Chinese community and helping to preserve this landmark neighborhood for generations to come. My deepest sympathy go out to his wife, children, family, and friends, who I hope find comfort in the life that Jack led as a community leader and a man who positively impacted on many people's lives. While I hope Jack's business and his iconic sign will continue to shine in Chinatown for decades to come, Vancouver has truly lost an icon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Nanama North, Kauchin. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, in these really difficult times we face, I'm reminded of my first uh, experiences with the history of the 1918 pandemic and the historical photos in our museums, uh, impressions by artists, local artists, of what that experience was like. And I think it's so important that we remember at this very difficult time that it, we will count on our artists to, re, to tell our story of these times, and we will count on our museums and our historians to record our history. And our government has not forgotten the importance of supporting these organizations and people. Grants that have gone to groups in my riding and in the region from the Arts Council include uh, Gabriel Arts Council, $40,000 grant, the BC Forest Discovery Centre, $82,000, the Arts Council of Ladysmith and District, 18,000. Cowichan Valley Arts Council, 17,000. Gabriel Historical and Museum Society, $7,000. It goes on. I wish I could read it all. I wish I had the five minutes it would take. There are dozens and dozens of recipients, and I think it's so important. I want to thank them for everything that they're doing to help us through this experience and how important they will be to the healing of our communities after we recover. And uh, I'm reminded now of the resiliency of our arts community. Um, the Lady Smith uh, Arts Council recently did a uh, online award show in which I participated um, and was honored to witness their uh, online art gallery that they've created. So it is resilience and innovation and imagination that is represented by our arts and culture community um, all of us, I know we will never forget the importance of these people to our lives. Member for Surrey South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The preservation of our heritage is imperative. It uh, provides us with insight into our past as to how our society has evolved. Our heritage allows us, <clears throat> excuse me, to understand our history and traditions it helps us to develop awareness about ourselves, helping us better understand why we are the way we are. Our heritage is also an integral part of culture, which plays an essential role in our view of society, business, politics, and the world. Our heritage directly and indirectly informs, influences, inspires uh, public debate and policy. The formation of the Fraser Valley Heritage Railway Society began with Mr. Jim Wallace's vision of reactivating the old um, BC Electric railway line in the Fraser Valley for passenger service. To execute his vision, Mr. Wallace used his personal savings to fund a feasibility study in the late 1990s. Then in 2001, the Fraser Valley Heritage Railway Society was established. Since then, the organization has worked both to restore and operate heritage into urban cars on the original BC Electric railway route through Surrey with a, a view to bringing uh, a mechanism to connect our heritage tourism destinations. The Fraser Valley Heritage Railway Society hosts several events throughout the year, be it the Halloween themed experience in October or the Electric Express, which is a journey through time to experience Christmas uh, over a hundred years ago. While the pandemic has restricted these activities, the spirit of the organization can't be sidelined. This year, the Fraser Valley Heritage Railway Society celebrates its 20th anniversary. Over the years, the organization's volunteers have worked hard to beautifully restore the interurbans to operational condition. They are preserving the community's important transportation heritage so it can be transformed to a legacy for the community to enjoy. When you have the chance, ride the rails with them. It's a great experience. Member for Langley East. Mr. Speaker, it's an honour today to rise in this house to share with you an organisation which does so much for those who often have no place to turn. An organisation that helps countless women in our community who are faced with what feel like hopeless circumstances, who feel as if, if, as if they have to choose between their life and personal safety, or a roof over their head and being able to provide security and shelter for their children something that unfortunately far too many women have faced. Under the leadership of Executive Director Pani Aghili, Ishtar Women's Resource Society is committed to preventing, breaking, and ending the cycle of abuse. 
The mission of the Ishtar Women's Resource Society is to honor, embrace, and celebrate the power, resilience, courage, and knowledge of all women. To fulfill its mission, Ishtar offers a wide range of programs for women and their children who are or have experienced domestic violence, including counseling, outreach services, community-based victim services, and affordable, secure transition housing. Children and youth experiencing violence of a parent or caregiver live in fear and anxiety for the next violent episode to occur. As a result of being exposed to family violence and or conflict, some children will show overt signs such as aggression or depression. Ishtar's program for children and youth experiencing violence is open to children and youth ages 3 to 18 years old and their non-offending parent or caregiver. Shockingly, Mr. Speaker, every six days a woman in Canada is killed by her intimate partner. My community values highly the important work of the Ishtar Women's Resource Society in preventing the tragedy of violence. Ishtar works collaboratively for systemic change towards a world where all women and girls are safe, emotionally, mentally, financially, physically, sexually, spiritually, and culturally, and where equality means inclusion, opportunity, and accessibility for all. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Peace River North. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to tell a great feel-good story about good people and humanity. This past November, Lynn Marchesall and her two children were driving from Georgia to Alaska to reunite with their husband and father when they experienced a Christmas miracle of sorts. The family had been away from Staff Sergeant Tim Marchesall through most of the pandemic, who was stationed in the United States Army at Fort Wainwright near Fairbanks. The Marchesals had been on the road for six days when they were caught in a snowstorm at Pink Mountain, just north of Fort St. John. In a recent interview with the Alaska Highway News, Lynn said the roads were awful. She'd never seen anything like it with lots of big trucks on the highway. In fact, she didn't know how they did it. Unfortunately, road conditions were worsening, so they decided, decided to stop at Pink Mountain. While her kids were using the restroom, Lynn became quite emotional at the gas station when Tina So noticed her in distress. Eventually, Lynn asked Tina if there was anyone she knew possibly with military experience that might be able to help take the family the rest of the way. Tina reached out to Canadian Forces member Tanya Hunt, whose Facebook page caught the eye of Joe Elliott and Prince George. Joe shared the post, and through a series of coincidences and mutual connections, it got to Fort St. John's Gary Bath who was also a Canadian Ranger, and he came to the rescue and drove the family to the Alaska border 1,800 kilometers away. Gary said that he saw lots of people saying that they wish they were able to help if they could, so he talked to his wife, Selena, and they decided that he would help them get the rest of the way. After hitting the road, they arrived at the Alaska border three days later. As you can imagine, there's lots of incredible little pieces of this trip that I don't have time to cover here. But since then, Gary's become quite the star from his story being covered on many Canadian news outlets, CNN, New York Times, BBC, many commendations from different commanders uh, throughout the United States military, and most recently, a free car from Planters Peanuts. Congratulations to Gary. Thank you for your service to humanity. Member for Surrey Fleet, Fleetwood. Thank you, uh, Honorable Speaker. Charan Paul Gill is no more. A labor and anti-racism activist, Charan Gill, sadly passed away on February 2nd, 2021. He was 84 years old. He took his last breath at Langley Memorial Hospital, surrounded by his family members. Charan moved to Canada in 1967 and went on to earn a BSW and MSW from UBC. He worked in, a, worked in a sawmill in Williams Lake in early days and later served as a social worker in Prince Rupert and other parts of the province. He moved to Surrey uh, in 1973, where he lived the rest of his life with his family. In 1980, he co-founded the Canadian Farm Workers Union and organized labor on farms, working with others, including with you, Honorable Speaker, which led to significant improvements in the wages and working conditions of British Columbians farm workers. 
1987, he started Progressive Intercultural Community Services Society, known as PIX, to serve the multicultural community in BC. PIX became a premier uh, community organization under his leadership as the CEO from 1987 to 2017. The organization provides programs to newcomers, operates two senior housing complex, adult day center, and the housing uh, Harmony House for women who are victims of domestic abuse. Fran also secured 2.5 acres of land in Cloverdale to build a modern long-term care home for seniors, the diversity village. Fran spent over three decades fighting against racism and for the rights of others, be they farm workers facing unfair labor practices, skilled immigrant, immigrants facing employment barriers, seniors looking for affordable housing, and women who are victims of domestic abuse. He made enormous contribution to make British Columbia a better place for everyone. For all his efforts, John received the Order of BC and the BC Human Rights Award, among many other honors. He leaves Mr. Speaker behind a powerful legacy that will inspire our new generation to carry on the struggle to build a better and more inclusive society. He was a good friend, and a good mentor to me during my early days in Canada when I worked at PIX under his leadership. I, along with countless others, will miss him dearly. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member. <laughs> Madam Clerk. Oral questions by members? Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, British Columbians de uh, demonstrated how concerned they were about getting their vaccination. And whether it was for themselves or they were calling for a frail elderly loved one, they were concerned. But it quickly became clear that the province was not prepared to handle the demand as thousands of British Columbians spent hours waiting on the phone. Many simply gave up. In fact, we saw the second largest health authority in our province, which serves a quarter of our population, manage to register only 369 people. It is not like this could not have been predicted. This is the most important public health effort in our lifetime. And it's clear that the government was not prepared for it, despite having a year to get ready. Instead, it descended into chaos. Can the Premier explain why his government was so unprepared for a vaccination rollout when they had over a year to prepare for it? Minister of Health. Uh, thank you to the member for her question and I uh, want to thank everyone in BC for their commitment to our immunization program, which was demonstrated, as the Leader of the Opposition says, uh, by the response yesterday. Yesterday we opened up uh, bookings for those over 90 in BC and Indigenous people over 65. We have already provided, or will have by the end of the week, about 30,000 immunizations in these categories of people, so that's roughly 50,000 people. Yesterday, 15,000 appointments. Uh, however, there were serious problems everywhere in BC, and as the member says, particularly in Vancouver Coastal Health. In four of the five health authorities, those problems were responded to by call centers that had been were in place for backup by those health authorities. Vancouver Coastal Health was fully was fully dependent on our call center provider to provide and to provide services based on the contract they had signed with us and the promises they repeatedly made about being prepared. That that contractor, the provider, tell us, failed us yesterday. And uh, for that failure, a lot of people wasted time and I think lost some confidence in the system confidence that we'll have to work hard to, re to rebuild uh, at every level uh, in terms of both technical issues that affected all health authorities and, uh, and staffing issues. The contractor, the provider, tell us, did not, get, did not meet its contractual obligations and let down people over 90 
and let down Indigenous people over 65, and it is unacceptable. We are taking steps, of course, to build, to beef up our ability to, to work and to support independently of TELUS, and TELUS has made commitments that these questions will be resolved, the technical questions and the staffing questions, ASAP. But we are not simply counting on that, and if they are not resolved, other actions will have to be taken. Leader of the official opposition. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate uh, the minister's answer, but let's be clear. The premier, the minister, uh, and anyone on the other side can blame everyone they want. They can blame the provider, they can, provi they can blame the health authorities, but ultimately, this government had oversight over the preparation of a vaccination rollout program for more than a year. And yesterday, even in the, in the minister's own words, it failed. But the Premier and the Minister need to look in the mirror because this was not unexpected. And in fact, this is the beginning of the process. This is a small number of registrants. And the, and the Minister is right. British Columbians have lost confidence in this process. Let's talk about Gail Helmkin and her 93-year-old parents who spent much of yesterday trying to register. Starting at 7 a.m., just like they were told to do, they eventually gave up. Gail says, and I quote, sometimes the message is thank you for calling, please call back. Sometimes you get a busy signal, sometimes there's no connection at all. It is frustration. I am very envious of Fraser, Fraser Health, which has an online booking system. I was disappointed that Coastal Health hasn't implemented that. So what does the Premier or the Minister have to say to the Helmkins today. It should certainly start with an apology and a recognition that this government has had over a year to put this process in place. What steps have been taken overnight to ensure that people like the Helmkins can register successfully today? Minister of Health. I appreciate the frustration that people feel, including the Helmkins. It was uh, obviously a frustrating situation for everyone including uh, the health authorities, including our staff, which has worked, I think everyone would agree, in an extraordinarily dedicated way uh, to address the COVID-19 pandemic. This is particularly true, I think, of the staff of Vancouver Cultural of Coastal Health who have been courageous and dedicated and had some extraordinary successes in this pandemic in very difficult times and provided support and comfort for people. Um, you bet I'm disappointed. And you bet I understand the disappointment of the Helmkins and lots of people around BC that uh, that the phone system, that our, that our system did not work adequately yesterday. 15,000 people got appointments. It was okay and not great in, in several health authorities. It was, it was not, uh, it was an, a, a total disappointment in Vancouver Coastal Health. Overnight, we're training people to supplement the provider because uh, that's necessary. Overnight, we're reaching out to doctors in Vancouver Coastal Health to ensure and to work to make sure that people over 90 uh, get registered this week. And of course, we have expectations that the provider will fill, uh, fulfill their contractual obligations. They're in the call center business. They have a responsibility to deliver on contracts they sign, to deliver adequate staff to make appointments. They did not do that yesterday. And, uh, and uh, should that situation continue, we will be taking action. Leader of Official Opposition, second supplemental. Well, thank you very much to the Minister. This isn't a criticism of the staff. The fact of the matter is that we have been in a pandemic for more than a year. And the hope that this government held out for British Columbians was that the vaccine was coming. So the minister can continue to talk about being disappointed and now we're gonna take some action. The time for that action was long before yesterday. We've seen these same kinds of challenges, the same kind of botched technology response with the COVID relief payments. It's deja vu all over again. People want and need to have confidence in the system. And yesterday, this government failed British Columbians miserably. So to the Premier, can he explain 
why despite the fact that other jurisdictions in this country have put in place an online booking system, can the Premier explain why there is not a province-wide online booking system that was ready to go on day one? And will he commit today to expediting the process to ensure that there are adequate resources in place to put an online booking system in place that will work for British Columbians? Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you to the member for her question. I agree with her that an online booking system will help. And as noted in our immunization plan, one will be in place province-wide for April 12th when we go wider with, uh, with this effort. And, uh, and uh, that's, uh, that online booking system will be helpful. There will still be the requirement for call centers for those people who either do not wish to book online or have difficulty booking online. So we will continue to need call center capacity. In this case, we were repeatedly repeatedly promised by TELUS, and in any event, it's in their contractual obligations that they would deliver the services necessary yesterday and through this week and through the coming weeks. And they did not, uh, they did not um, uh, meet their contractual obligations. So we are taking steps, of course, to beef up uh, resources so that we can get through uh, the appointment bookings this week. 15,000 out of the roughly 50,000 people we need to book on the first day. We have four more days to do it. And I, again, uh, acknowledge and apologize to people who were so frustrated yesterday. I can I tell them, having spoken to a number of them, that I share uh, their frustration. And we're going to be taking steps to improve the situation in the coming days. Member for Kamloops, South Thompson. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, well, the, the minister uh, has gone to great lengths uh, uh, today and in, in days leading up to uh, the fiasco that happened yesterday to blame uh, everyone uh, around uh, the, uh, the situation here as opposed to simply looking in the mirror and acknowledging that the ultimate responsibility, the, the ultimate responsibility to ensure uh, that there is a an appointment booking system that works uh, for British Columbians, uh, that that's the responsibility of uh, of his government. That's the responsibility of the Minister of Health. It's the responsibility of the Premier. And on that responsibility, Mr. Speaker, uh, they, they failed miserably uh, yesterday. Um, the, the minister has, has also gone out of his way to specifically uh, highlight uh, failings on the part of uh, the service provider TELUS. Um, Mr. Speaker, I, I, I would I'd like to ask uh, the Premier today, if, uh, uh, in light of uh, uh, those, those comments, if he would be willing uh, to table uh, the TELUS contract in the House uh, and tell us specifically uh, what services uh, the government required TELUS to provide. Uh, were online services a part of uh, that contract? And uh, how much uh, is, was TELUS contracted uh, to provide these services uh, to British Columbians yesterday? Minister of Health. Uh, the contract in question was for call center services uh, with TELUS. That is their business. Uh, it's not the primary business of Vancouver Coastal Health, for example. Uh, they were uh, contracted to provide uh, specific numbers of agents and to ensure that the system worked well. We did have an overwhelming response from people, not unexpectedly, but an overwhelming response. And in many health authorities, they were able to adapt in spite of the challenges for, of our providers in, uh, in booking a significant number of appointments, 15,000 province-wide out, out of the 50, the group of 50,000 who are eligible for appointments. So that was not the case, of course, in Vancouver Coastal Health. So the contract uh, that the member refers to is for call center services. And simply put, um, the responsibility for that, the problem there, was the re responsibility uh, of the provider. They signed a contract, they made commitments, they made promises, and they did not deliver yesterday. They have uh, committed to me and to uh, the people of BC that they will be do better. But we are not waiting for that. We are going to be adding uh, staffing to ensure that uh, that uh, seniors over 90 
and that Indigenous seniors over 65 get the services they deserve this week, get the appointments booked so that we can get those immunizations done next week. We have a few more days. I appreciate that the, the patience of people in BC was tried yesterday, people seeking appointments. I share their frustration and uh, we will be taking steps to improve the situation. Member for Kamloops, South Thompson, on supplemental question. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> well, the, um, uh, the government's uh, uh, lack of preparedness, um, frankly, betrays a level of incompetence which is shocking. The, uh, uh, to, to, to suggest that, uh, 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 that it's acceptable uh, to, in today's day and age in British Columbia, uh, that uh, uh, Fraser Health uh, was able to arrange uh, for over 8,700 uh, bookings yesterday, uh, but Vancouver Coastal was only able to uh, arrange for uh, 369 bookings, um, is beyond the, the uh, total disappointment that the minister has cited in his previous answers today. It's completely and totally unacceptable. Now, Mr. Speaker, uh, it, it drives the, the question, what, what accounts for, for such a wide disparity uh, in different parts of the province? Uh, the answer is that Fraser Health was the one health authority that provided for both uh, phone uh, bookings and online bookings. Uh, because apparently that was left up to health authorities uh, to determine. It wasn't, there was no province-wide standard. It's the minister's responsibility, it's the government, the premier's responsibility to make sure that all British Columbians have access uh, to this booking system, that they have access both from a phone and an online perspective, and that it should not matter where in the province uh, you actually live. Mr. Speaker, um, uh, the question uh, to uh, uh, the Premier again, uh, will, will he commit to tabling this TELUS contract uh, in the House today? And can he explain why his government uh, to this point has allowed for a, a process of different, uh, different uh, service levels to be provided in different parts of the province instead of ensuring all British Columbians are treated equally, all British Columbians have access to both online and phone uh, appointments so they can arrange for their important vac vaccinations. Minister of Health. Uh, thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker. All British Columbians will have access to an online platform uh, starting April 12th, as we said last week. Um, as the, m the member will be aware, and this is not uh, new in BC, it certainly was the case when I became Minister of Health. All health, many of the health authorities have different uh, platforms, online platforms, and health record systems in our province. That's the reality of the situation, and uh, and improvements have been made. But this question today was not a question of that; it's a question of a call center process. I think it's fair to say that uh, using a leading call center provider to assist in this effort was a would is is a good decision, and that they did not uh, follow through on their contractual obligation yesterday. And uh, if the member thinks that I think that's acceptable, he's incorrect. I think it is completely unacceptable. In four of the five health authorities, including Fraser, but also uh, Interior Health, where the member lives, for example, they were able to, because we had a backup health authority call center to support um, our provider, we were able to complete six times as many appointments in Vancouver Coastal Health. So in Interior Health and in Northern Health uh, and in Vancouver Island Health and in Fraser Health, where there were also problems, some of the technical problems that existed, uh, partly because of the an overwhelming response, but partly because there were technical issues which were again the responsibility of the provider. Um, there were significant problems, but they achieved or meet, met their goals and will, I think, if they continue at that level, do that this week for, the, for their populations over 90 and over 65. Vancouver Coastal Health requires change and change is happening. And it's our expectation that tell us one, take responsibility, and two, take the steps necessary to fulfill their contract, not just with the government and the province, but with the people of BC on, at this important time in the pandemic and in our history. Leader, third party. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. We lost 1,716 people to drug toxicity in 2020. We've already lost 165 people in the first month of 2021. People are dying every single day. We are in the middle of two health crises and we need to start acting like it. 
We must prioritize the development of systemic policy responses that are immediate, evidence-based, and accessible. This is not about drugs. People are dying from drug policy. Decriminalizing possession of small amounts of illicit drugs is a fundamental part of supporting those who use drugs in BC and who are most vulnerable to death from the toxic supply. Dr. Henry called the decriminalization of drugs a necessary step in addressing this crisis. The City of Vancouver has submitted a request to the federal government to embrace decriminalization municipally. We can take direct action here in British Columbia, and we need to do it now to save lives. My question for you, Honourable Speaker, is to the Premier. Can he outline exactly what, his, what powers his government has available in order to move forward with decriminalization of simple possession of drugs in BC. Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. Uh, decriminalization is a priority for our government. Uh, in addition to the work that we are doing to build a full system of care to address people's addiction challenges, whether that's building more beds, whether that's standing up more uh, supervised consumption sites, um, whether working on safe supply. Decriminalization is part of that, particularly because uh, if we treat uh, addiction and simple possession of small amounts of illicit drugs as a criminal matter instead of a health care matter, it presents a barrier to treatment um, and particularly the kind of stigma that makes people use drugs alone and when they use alone, tragically, they die alone. Uh, last year, uh, the Solicitor General uh, asked the uh, police force to uh, address uh, possession, small amounts of personal possession of illicit drugs as a health care matter, not as a criminal pro um, priority. Last summer, the Premier wrote to the Prime Minister, asking the Prime Minister, because this is a federal matter, to uh, adopt a nationwide approach to decriminalization. The Premier put it in my mandate letter, asking me to fast track decriminalization as a way to combat the overdose crisis and, and further separate people from the toxic drug supply. I'm in active conversations with the federal health minister now, um, and as one of many approaches our government is bringing uh, to combat the overdose crisis, we are, um, we're optimistic that that can remove a barrier to people accessing the treatment they need. Leader third party on supplemental. Thank you, Honorable Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that response. Decriminalization, decriminalization is regularly painted as a federal issue, something this government likes to deflect their responsibility from. The federal government is an important leader in moving towards decriminalization of simple possession, but they are not the only ones responsible. It is a move that we can make as a province instead of always going back to the federal government. Dr. Henry outlined in 2019 how the province can decriminalize people who use drugs, not drugs themselves, on our own. Options have been on the table for years and government has decided not to pursue them with the urgency that this health emergency requires. Since then, we have seen hundreds of lives lost at an increasing rate. We can take measures to decriminalize drug users in this province on our own and we have not done so. My question again is to the Premier. There are options here in-house to stop decriminalize, to stop criminalizing drug users, why has he not used these powers to save lives since 2019? Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this is a national overdose crisis. Uh, people are dying across um, the entire country, uh, tragically, and particularly with the confluence of the pandemic, uh, both the um, COVID public health emergency and the overdose health emergency, uh, we have seen a tragic increase in drugs due to drug, um, due to increased, <laughs> tragic loss of life due to increases in drug toxicity. Um, we have taken action in advance. Uh, the uh, Solicitor General has sent letters to police departments asking them to not pursue matters of uh, 
uh, personal possession as a matter of criminal uh, priority. I'm asking police instead to focus on true crime. Uh, we have pilot projects with three police forces where people are being connected with healthcare instead of with the criminal justice system. Uh, the Premier wrote to the uh, Prime Minister, um, did not receive a reply last summer, but nevertheless, uh, conversations with the federal health minister, because this is a federal matter, um, that is, uh, th this is where the responsibility sits. We are asking the federal government to, to um, take up its priority and responsibility. Uh, and as my mandate letter uh, spells out, if we do not have prompt act action from the federal government, then I am, uh, along with some of my uh, colleagues in government uh, to pursue a made in BC solution. That will be our fallback if the federal government uh, fails to take its, um, its place and its power to lead. Member for Vancouver, Langara. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, we hear today from the Premier and the Minister of Health in response to my colleagues in terms of the challenges with the vaccination rollout. British Columbians deserve better. This is such a critical time for the entire province. Many elderly and family members are all stressed, trying to get through the call centers. And in Vancouver, Coastal Health, I know many of my constituents have had that challenge. And yet, all we hear today from this government is blame the service provider, blame the staff. We need leadership from this government. This is the most critical time for this province that we can give to British Columbians. We know it's been a long period of time for a year. We know we've all made sacrifices, including in this house. We need better answers, Mr. Speaker. So if we look at the TELUS contract, we understand that the government, of course, has procurement processes. You would expect that through the Minister of Citizen Services that there would be a detailed scoping out of the expectations that the government would have for these call centers. We are asking for transparency, Mr. Speaker. We're asking for accountability. We're asking for this government to step up and show the leadership that this province needs at this critical time. Not to blame others. Not to continue to bungle what is the most critical vaccination rollout for all British Columbians. So, Mr. Speaker, the reason why we're asking for the contract, of course, if they're deflecting to the contract service provider, tell us. It raises questions. Has the Premier talked to and communicated his concerns to the leadership team at TELUS? What expectations did the government have about these call centers? What penalties? What measures can be taken by this government if the service provider is not meeting those requirements? So through you, Mr. Speaker, to the Premier, again, will you do a service to the government and to our province by sharing that contract so that we can see what the penalties and ramifications are when the service provider does not perform? Minister of Health. Honourable Speaker, the reason I'm holding the service provider accountable is because I represent the people of Vancouver Kingsway and the people of BC. And in this case, they need to be held accountable. They need to deliver on what they promised to deliver and yesterday did not deliver in any acceptable way. We did book 15,000 appointments yesterday, often because of the very dedicated work of people working in health authorities themselves and their efforts. Uh, I, of course, very much appreciate 15,000. I have a group of 50,000 means that we, can, that we can succeed in booking the appointments for this week that we need to book. That said, we have a, we have a contract for TELUS to provide uh, call center services. And those call center services were inadequate yesterday in spite of repeated com promises to us and a contract that said they would be in place. And so, uh, uh, Honourable Speaker, we're taking the two steps we need to take. Hold the service provider accountable and demand that uh, staffing levels be increased commensurate with the challenge, one, and commensurate to their contractual commitments. And two, we are actively adding 
uh, our own resources so that people will not continue to have to face delays, especially in Vancouver Coastal Health, where the situation was unacceptable yesterday. I do ask people for patience. This week, it's going to be people over 90 and Indigenous people over 65 who are able to book appointments. Uh, we believe that uh, through the week that we're going to be able to succeed in that. That doesn't mean that we think yesterday was in any way acceptable. It was not, and we are, going to, we are taking the steps now to ensure that the situation is improved today and in the coming days. Thank you. Member for Vancouver, Lingaran, supplemental. Mr. Speaker, the reason why we are taking the time here to ask these questions at this juncture is because we're hearing from the government as well that the online service will be up by April 12th. Presumably there's another contract for that service with service expectations. And so we need to know what those expectations or the requirements are. Because otherwise the government can just continue to deflect to say, well, the service provider didn't perform. So we need clearly transparency. We need to see the contract as well for the online service provider because we need to have confidence that this government can actually meet the requirements to get the vaccination rollout done in terms of the scheduling and the actual procedures themselves. So again, I would ask the Premier to answer this question. The contract with TELUS presumably has set out the requirements for those call centers. The government is saying that TELUS effectively has not met those requirements. Is the government then taking the position that TELUS has breached its contract with the government? Minister of Health. Uh, yesterday, uh, Honourable Speaker, uh, 8,749 people booked, or 8,722 people booked uh, uh, appointments in the Fraser Health Authority, 2,456 in the Interior Health Authority, 2,345 in Vancouver Island Health Authority, 1,007 in the Northern Health Authority, all of which had issues, parts in part related to the extraordinary response we, sh we saw in Vancouver Coastal Health, which was solely dependent on our service provider, who is TELUS, they booked 369. So I think it is fair to hold TELUS accountable. But what I want to do today is to hold them accountable and ensure that the situation improves right now for people over 90, right now for Indigenous people over 65. And that's what we're doing by, by supporting our service provider in training and ensuring that staff are in place to support those efforts so that we get those appointments booked this week and that pe people can do that with, uh, with, uh, the, with less um, frustration than they've seen so far. That's, uh, that's one. And two, hold the service provider accountable. Uh, we need them to deliver what they said they would deliver to us and to the people of BC. And um, the members have said it themselves, 369 doesn't cut it when other health authorities did more only because really they had backup call centers in those health authorities. So uh, that's the steps we're taking now. Action to make sure things get better, accountability for our service provider. I think those are the two steps that we all need to take. The bell ends question period. Honourable Members, I have the honour to present a report and teach old Vancouver Community College Executive Compensation Disclosures Audit from the Office of the Auditor General. Member of North Vancouver, Seymour. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. I rise before the House today to bring forth a petition from a member of my constituency a year ago, Yasmin Abidi of North Vancouver Seymour found Lucky, an owl that was on the ground and dying. It was determined that the toxin ingested was a rodenticide, carried by a rat or mouse that had been attracted and eaten at a bait box that had been put out commercially. These insecticide-based bait box boxes are used commercially for vermin control. Member, this whole process member. interferes with the food chain of the end. Oh, I'm sorry. Member. I apologize, Your, Your Honour. Mr. Speaker, I apologize. 
Yeah, you don't have to explain the entire uh, petition. Just succinctly, just tell us what it is about, and then we will just present it. My apologies, Mr. Speaker. Learning. Thank you. Um, okay, so the, the uh, petition is asking for a ban on rodenticide uh, because of its impact on the food chain. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Madam Clerk. Orders of the day. Government House Leader. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker. I call Bill, uh, second reading, Bill 12, Miscellaneous Statutes, Minor Correction Amendment Act. Thank you, members. Uh, if I could ask members uh, who are having conversations to take it outside uh, so we can get on with the business of today, I would appreciate it. Uh, I, I, I would rather not use the gavel. If I might ask members, please take your conversations outside. Thank you. I would like to acknowledge the minister responsible for housing, but for today, the uh, attorney general for a very exciting legislation. <laughs> minister. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. I know members are, uh, have been looking forward to this bill. I move that the bill be now read a second time. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Bill 12 makes minor corrections and housekeeping amendments to various statutes. They're all intended to be straightforward, non-controversial corrections, and all minor in nature. The contents of the bill, I think, when read, members will see, uh, reflects that. Uh, the Office of Legislative Counsel gathers minor corrections as part of the routine revision process. The results of that work is what we have in this bill. Uh, I think it's important to note and a good opportunity to note in relation to this bill the role of the Office of Legislative Counsel. Uh, they take great pride in the work that they do on behalf of all of us in this House. Uh, the changes in this bill are presented before the Legislature so that uh, we, as members, can approve all changes to statutes no matter how small or minor those changes may appear. In other words, this is a, a reminder to everybody as well about the critically important principle that um, editors can't just go in and change the law. Uh, they have to have the approval of our legislature before any changes may be made, no matter how minor the change. I want to thank uh, the Office of Legislative Counsel and all staff members there for their work in preparing statutes for us uh, in this House and to do so with such accuracy uh, that uh, happily uh, these corrections are so minor in nature. Uh, the changes need to be done with the authority of this House to ensure that our laws are orderly and correct. I will uh, take this moment uh, to note uh, that we do not have uh, the former leader of the Green Party, Andrew Weaver, uh, in the House. Uh, he took great delight in these bills and often um, uh, went into some significant detail. Uh, and uh, I wanted to recognize his contribution to bills in the past, uh, although I am uh, glad to see a member from Oak Bay, Gordon Head, from our party, of course. Uh, with that said, uh, Honourable Speaker, I'll, uh, I'll take my place and I look forward to hearing the debate on this bill. Thank you, Minister. Recognizing the member for Abbotsford West. Uh, thanks, Mr. Speaker. As the Attorney has uh, mentioned, uh, these bills have become uh, a regular feature of the parliamentary uh, agenda, at least on, a, on an annual basis. I, too, uh, wish to uh, pay tribute to the, uh, the work of uh, legislative Council that uh, the excellence of which transcends uh, uh, the various governments that are uh, sworn in uh, from time to time through the uh, the history of the uh, the province I don't I do not wish to uh, belabor the uh, debate in uh, second reading but I what I will do is highlight to the uh, uh, to the attorney uh, when we get to committee stage the the following uh, sections that uh, I will pose short questions about, and they are sections uh, 3, uh, section 8, 
section 15, uh, section 20, uh, uh, 33, uh, 40, 42, and 44. Uh, those are the questions, uh, those are the sections I anticipate having very brief uh, questions about. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you for the uh, opportunity to make submissions at this stage of the debate. Thank you, member. Seeing no further speakers, Attorney General. Uh, thank you, uh, Honorable uh, Speaker, and I um, note with appreciation the bipartisan and I'm sure tripartisan uh, consensus about the role of our, uh, our talented uh, Legislative Council. Um, and I appreciate the member um, providing a heads up about the sections uh, uh, of particular uh, interest and will be uh, prepared to answer his questions in committee stage. With that, I move second reading. Second reading of Bill 12, the Miscellaneous Statutes Minor Corrections Amendment Act 2021. All those in favor, say aye or indicate. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Attorney. Uh, thank you, Honorable Speaker. I move the bill be committed to a committee of the whole House to be considered at the next sitting of the House after today. Members have heard the question. All those in favor, indicate aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. Motion carried. Thank you, Minister. Government House Leader. Thank you, thank you uh, Honorable Speaker. I call second reading of Bill Number 5 in Titchell, the Insurance Corporation Amendment Act 2021. Thank you, Minister. Minister. Thank you, uh, Honorable Speaker. I move that the bill now be read a second time. It's my pleasure to rise today to speak about Bill 5, the Insurance Corporation Amendment Act 2021. Mr. Speaker, the Insurance Corporation Act of British Columbia will implement enhanced care coverage, a fundamentally different audio insurance model beginning May the 1st, 2021. Enhanced care will result in more affordable premiums for drivers and provide enhanced benefits to British Columbians recovering from a vehicle crash, all delivered by a public insurer that British Columbians can trust and have confidence in. As a companion to the move to the new insurance model, we committed to establishing a new fairness officer with a legislated mandate to review and make recommendations to ICBC to resolve individual customer complaints, as well as with respect to policy and process related to customer fairness. This amendment to the Insurance Corporation Act advances the building of trust and confidence in ICBC by providing the authority for the Lieutenant Governor and Council to appoint an ICBC Fairness Officer for a three-year renewable term. The Fairness Officer will be mandated to hear a complaint from a person who believes that the ICB pro ICBC process that led to a decision was unfair. In addition, the Officer will, on their own initiative, be able to identify processes that may lead to an unfair decision in the future. The officer will be empowered to make recommendations to the ICBC board when warranted. Further, the furnace officer may provide advice and assistance to a person with respect to ICBC processes. The terms and conditions of the fairness officer's appointment may be set by the corporation, subject to the approval of the minister responsible for ICBC, and the necessary expenses for the fairness officer and their staff will be paid by the corporation. Transparency is a foundational pillar in building trust and confidence. That's why the fairness officer will be required to report on their activities to the ICBC board and to publish those reports on a publicly accessible website. In addition, the ICBC board will be required to prepare an annual report for the minister outlining ICBC's responses to any recommendations submitted by the officer and to make that report public as well. We have been mindful of the requirements of the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act as we have developed this legislation. We have done an assessment of this legislation as it relates to the aligning with the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, establishing a new fairness officer as Bill 
five proposes do not, does not uniquely affect the indigenous rights described in the UN Declaration. The changes introduced in Bill 5 will provide British Columbians with confidence in knowing that they will be treated fairly when they deal with ICBC and that when they speak up to raise concerns, ICBC will be listening and will be accountable to them. Honorable Speaker, this legislation is a continuing part of our commitment to make the changes necessary to ensure that ICBC has the long-term viable ne viability necessary to continue to provide insurance, public insurance, to British Columbians, to ensure that rates are affordable, to ensure that care is there when they need it, for as long as they need it. And I look forward to the debate um, from members from both sides of the House on this important step forward as we ensure that ICBC continues to deliver value, safety, and quality care to the motorists of this province. Thank you, Minister. Recognizing the member for Prince George Mackenzie. Thank you, Speaker. Well, it, uh, as I speak to this bill, um, and I listen to the member uh, outlining uh, his rationale and reasons for this, it's reflective of what we have in place already. So I, I went online and had a look. We've had a ICBC Fairness Commissioner in place in this province uh, for decades. And uh, he, uh, you know, the, the same individual actually since 2005. Um, I'm just going to review uh, for the House uh, the roles and, and authority that the current process has, the current Fairness Commissioner has. His role is to investigate, conduct reviews, and make findings and recommendations to ICBC management and or the Board of Directors similar to what the uh, Minister has just reflected this new bill uh, addresses. The Officer of the Fairness Commissioner's jurisdiction deals with fairness of process or administration. He does not have jurisdiction to deal with disputes that relate solely to the amount of a final payment or the assessment of liability, same as the new legislation is, is, uh, is addressing. The uh, Fairness Commission has the, the power to insist on the production of any documents or other information from ICBC, and if necessary, take evidence under oath or otherwise from the customer or representative of ICBC. So again, very similar processes that are currently in place. The Fairness Commissioner must be totally independent. In particular, the Commissioner is independent of ICBC, any prior decisions that may have been made by ICBC. It says that he or she must be impartial in all respects and accessible to the public, either in writing or online, and responsive to those who write. Very similar to the legislation that's before the House here uh, today, Mr. Speaker. And upon completion of the review, the Fairness Commissioner can, refu or can refer the matter back to ICBC for reconsideration, can make recommendations to ICBC, or he can dismiss the complaint if the Commissioner finds no unfairness on the part of ICBC or its employees. So uh, again, uh, I see two paths here. So I have to question, so what was or what is the problem that government sees with the current Fairness Commissioner, with the current structure. So I, I reviewed the reports, and again, the, the, this bill suggests that the new Fairness Officer will be reporting on an annual basis uh, of what, uh, what they find, the number of reports they have, or the number of complaints that they have. That's already been in place. There's a number of historical reports that are on file already under the ICBC website, under the Fairness uh, Commissioner's website. But for 2019-2020, the Fair Fairness Commissioner reported that it received 411 complaints in total. And we have to remember that of the 411 complaints that they've received, ICBC has over 3 million customers. So we have 411 complaints in total with 3 million customers. But out of those 411 complaints, 
90% of them were referred back to ICBC customer services and result. So only 10% or less than 10% were referred to the Fairness Commissioner for resolution. And out of those, out of those 44 that were reviewed by the Fairness Commissioner, 95% received the determination that there was no unfairness in the process. So here we have just a small fragment of the 3 million customers of ICBC submitting complaints to the Fairness Commissioner's office and uh, just a small segment of that being, being uh, looked at by the Fairness Commissioner. So what was the factor that um, this government looked at in, to suggest that a fairness officer needs to be legislated into the process here? The Attorney General uh, made a statement about a year ago that British Columbians should have peace of mind that they will be treated fairly after they have been injured in a crash. To suggest that they haven't been treated fairly by ICBC um, after they've uh, been in a crash. And I reference the, the recent Supreme Court decision um, where the court has assured that British Columbia can still rely on the courts to hear their issues uh, if they decide to take them to uh, the BC Supreme Court to hear, uh, to hear their arguments. So is it worth establishing a new office and government infrastructure to simply replace a process that already exists? And I, I you know, the old saying is that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So again, I, I have to question the, the reasonableness of establishing something in legislation that is already working very well in, in, uh, in policy with ICBC and the Fairness uh, Commissioner. Um, I had a look at, uh, so the, the other aspect of this, if people aren't satisfied with the results of the Fairness Commissioner, they have the full right to go and, and file a complaint with the Ombudsperson's office and the Ombudsperson's Office has released one report regarding ICBC, and that report was dated back in 2005. So obviously there's been no systemic issues within the current system that gives rise to the fact that the current system is not working properly. And, uh, you know, I, I reviewed recent uh, activity within the Ombudsperson's Office with respect to complaints about ICBC, and again, uh, there, are, there is minimal activity, minimal complaints going to the Auburn's person's office that haven't been resolved out of the three million customers that we have uh, or that ICBC has in British Columbia, over three million customers, and it's just a fraction of, of uh, you know, 0.006%, I believe it was with the, uh, the math that I did on that, have... Uh, have had complaints submitted to the Ombudsperson's office or to the Fairness Commissioner's office. So again, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, this legislation I think is, is trying to, to do something uh, to replace a, a very effective process that is already in place. And I don't really see the need uh, for this to, uh, uh, to, to be implemented, but we'll pop the hood open on it during the third reading, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, see where that takes us. But uh, I'll be curious to find out some of the rationale behind government that time. Thank you. Thank you, Member. Recognizing the member for Vancouver, False Creek. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I do want to acknowledge that there is uh, some work being done on the condo above mine. So if it becomes too distracting, Mr. Speaker, please do let me know and we'll pass to a colleague. Thank you, member. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Apologies, just opening my notes. I'm pleased to rise to speak to Bill 5, the Insurance Corporation Amendment Act 2021. Being involved in a motor vehicle accident is traumatic and it's stressful. 
even in situations where you're not at fault or the injury or damage is not profoundly life altering, the experience is tough. And feeling that you can't trust your insurer serves to add stress to the accident. People deserve to know that they're gonna be treated fairly after they've been in a crash. And Bill 5 provides for the appointment of a fairness officer. It sets out the fairness officer's powers and duties in relation to fairness complaints, and it sets out regulation-making powers of the fairness officer as well. The Lieutenant Governor and Council will appoint a fairness officer for a three-year term, and individual can serve in this role for two such terms. The fairness officer may, on their own initiative or in response to a complaint, investigate a decision or recommendation made, an act done or omitted, a procedure used. The fairness officer, in addition, may make recommendations to the corporation to resolve fairness complaints, make recommendations about systemic problems with the fairness corporation process, provide advice and assistance to members of the public and other duties, and may not comment or make recommendations respecting an amount payable to the corp or the extent of persons responsible for an accident. Section 56 authorizes the fairness officer to investigate a fairness complaint in respect of a matter subject to proceeding or a court tribunal. Pardon me, it does not allow the fairness officer to investigate these, or a matter that was the subject of arbitration or an arbitral award. And something that I want to highlight because of its extreme importance in this, in this bill is the transparency that's incorporated into this role and the proposed act. Specifically, Section 60 ensures the publication of information both to the corporation but also to the public. The fairness officer will be required to report the number of fairness complaints they receive and the number of fairness complaints they like to hear, not dissimilar to the prior fairness commission. The fairness officer must publish on a publicly accessible website the rules made under Section 58 and the report submitted to the corporation under Section 59. And by August 31st of each year, submit an annual report that first summarizes the corporation's responses in the previous fiscal year to the fairness officer's recommendations. And the corporation must publish the annual report to the minister, but again, also on a public website. Mr. Speaker, I'm highlighting this because it's a reflection of this government's commitment to ensuring ICBC decisions, actions, and practices are transparent and they are fair. Having a new independent fairness officer position will ensure that complaints, disputes, and procedural matters will be fairly addressed. Ensuring the independence from ICBC of the officer is important. In Bill 5, note that the fairness officer is not appointed by the corporation, but by government. All of this, pardon me, all of this will improve the transparency and accountability at ICBC. People deserve to know that they will be treated fairly after they've been injured in a crash. The establishment of an impartial authority with transparent reporting requirements will help to rebuild trust in ICBC. The fairness officer role is being enhanced so it can settle disputes and also watch for trends in the way that ICBC is treating motorists. These changes to the role of the prior fairness commissioner bolster flagging public trust in the Crown Court. More independence, more public accountability. This dovetails with other important changes ICBC this government has moved on, moved to an enhanced care model and resulting savings and refunds provided to BC drivers, putting financial information into plain language reports so that ratepayers can see where their dollars are going. All of this is leading to an insurance system that works for all British Columbians, insurance that is more affordable and provides the care and coverage needed if a consumer is involved in a crash. And it really comes from a commitment to fairness. Fairness that is reflected in the move to a driver-based system where at-fault crashes will be tied to the driver rather than the individual who owns the vehicle. Fairness that ensures that good drivers are no longer paying more to cover costs for those who cause crashes or present higher risks on our roads. Each driver's experience in crash history will play a bigger role in determining premiums, as has previously been discussed. 
Another area that's been reviewed and changed through a fairness lens is the ability to pay privately for the cost of an at-fault claim, which is a unique feature that many insurance companies do not offer. The problem was it masked the driver's risk to the public. Moving, keeping the repairs out of the ICB system, ICBC system to a limit of 2,000 allows for this to occur only in relatively minor claims and stops the ability for wealthy drivers who can afford to pay for repairs privately to dodge the implications to their insurer. Bad drivers should pay more than good drivers. Fairness. In addition, there are now new discounts for safer drivers graduated over a longer period of time. There are discounts for vehicles with automatic emergency braking, AEB, for vehicles driven less than 5,000 kilometers a year as well. And this transition to enhanced care coverage is coming this spring. So in sum, the new fairness officer is part of a more fair insurance system that works for everyone. The new fairness officer introduced in this bill, Bill 5, is more independent and will provide increased transparency. This, along with a number of other changes, some of which I've outlined here, will give British Columbians the confidence of knowing that ICBC is accountable and that they will be treated fairly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member. Uh, recognizing the member for Vancouver Langara. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I uh, rise today to uh, speak to Bill 5, the Insurance Corporation Amendment Act. And uh, I, I would say, uh, Mr. Speaker, listening to the comments from uh, the member from Falls Creek, Vancouver Falls Creek, and welcome her to this house in that manner. Uh, we are close in proximity in terms of our Vancouver ridings. But I, I will say that uh, my remarks this morning about Bill 5, I hope, will be helpful to members of the House to, that they can put in perspective uh, this so-called uh, fairness officer uh, under ICBC's thumb. And as the member from uh, Prince George Mackenzie uh, went through in great detail, we have concerns and questions about that role, the jurisdiction, the duties, the responsibilities, and indeed the lack of independence of this fairness officer. So I would say to uh, my colleague across the aisle, the member from Vancouver Falls Creek, that uh, I would invite her and other members of the House to closely look at this bill in the context of the Insurance Corporation Act, the no-fault regime that the government brought forward that we debated at length last summer in this House, so that uh, she can better inform herself as well in terms of the lack of fairness that we are going to be seeing under this new regime that's to be implemented on May 1st. Like many things that the government has brought forward in this COVID challenging time, there are many priorities of government. And we know, as we just talked about in question period, the importance of the vaccination rollout and the continued challenges that this government has had with that rollout. But I question, Mr. Speaker, what we're gonna see with the no-fault rollout as well on May 1st. This is the one bill that the, the uh, government has brought forward in this juncture to deal with a component of the no-fault regime. So, Mr. Speaker, uh, before turning to the construction of Bill 5, uh, of the Fairness Officer, and I would say that um, if I need to, I'd like to take the time as the designated speaker on this bill, uh, if I may. I. Uh, would like to take a brief moment to talk about the road that has led us to this point. As I mentioned, Mr. Speaker, I've spoken to at length and raised my concerns in the past in this House about the conflicting hats that our Attorney General was asked to wear by the Premier with respect to his dual role as Attorney General 
And now, as he was formerly then, the minister responsible for ICBC. We just saw the new minister responsible for ICBC, of course, speak to this bill in this house. And again, I dare say that that minister needs to carefully consider how this fairness officer, the role, the office itself, how it is positioned within the new regime that the government has brought forward that took away the ability of injured British Columbians to pursue their rights. And what did they replace that with, Mr. Speaker? Well, in part, they replaced that with an enhanced fairness officer, so they say. But we will look at that more in detail. They replaced that with the Civil Resolution Tribunal, a greater jurisdiction for the CRT. And as I have, and many of my colleagues, had the opportunity over some years now, we've had many debates about the Civil Resolution Tribunal, the jurisdiction, the setting of the minor injury, definition, the expansion of the minor injury definition by regulation, to include brain injury and concussion, even when the Attorney General assured those who suffer and those families of members who suffer from brain injury and concussions that the minor injury definition would not be expanded, that definition was expanded by regulation. I'd like to also speak to the context in which the government brought forward 107 pages of regulation last Friday. This is important, Mr. Speaker, to understand the context in which the fairness officer is operating. But that minor injury definition was expanded to include, as the Attorney General has stated to myself and others in this House, 80% of all motor vehicle injury injuries that one could seek recovery from. Well, Mr. Speaker, as I've said it before and I'll say it again, when the Premier put the Attorney General in a, dual, in a dual role in 2017. The Attorney General, of course, as the Chief Legal Officer of this province, of this government, must represent the interests of justice on the one hand. And as the member from Point, Vancouver Point Grey was asked, to look out for the financial interests of ICBC and Mr. Speaker, that is the problem. We are seeing now, again, the clear indications from our own judicial system that there is a problem. First, our courts deemed the rule limiting the use of expert reports to be unconstitutional. This is one of a series of court decisions where the courts have had to beat back the Attorney General of this province for taking decisions and coming up with policies that were not constitutional. And now, Mr. Speaker, we see just in this past week, our province's Chief Justice has ruled again that another set of laws is unconstitutional. How many defeats does it take? How much resources, how many resources of our province does it require for us to be in court, for this government to be losing court decision after court decision after court decision. Just this past week, the Chief Justice ruled that parts of the Civil Relations tri Tribunal are unconstitutional. That is the main parts of that jurisdiction. Quite simply, our Chief Justice said that the people have a constitutional right to access the courts, and what our Attorney General sought to have the CRT do eroded that constitutional right. The importance of the decision, decision needs to be highlighted, and it starts with basic principles. The job of an Attorney General is to advise the government on the constitution of laws that it wishes to pass. When a law is vetted by the Attorney General and subsequently denied or deemed unconstitutional by the courts, there is no clearer indication, Mr. Speaker, that the Attorney General has failed 
to properly carry out his duties. And this, Mr. Speaker, is the rub. The Attorney General either did not know the laws he was making were unconstitutional, or he knew, and he did them anyways. Mr. Speaker, I don't know which is worse. When it happens twice, it's even more troubling. And this is part of the continued pattern that we see from this Attorney General and this government. And Mr. Speaker, when you consider the way in which the Attorney General is allowed to operate in the last few years, it becomes even more concerning. When this NDP government came to power, they had a unique idea that fucked tradition. For the first time in the history of British Columbia, this government thought it would be a good idea to give the Attorney General, who again is in charge of protecting the rights of British Columbians, the legal rights, the power to also handle the responsibility for ICBC, which, as we've discussed numerous times in this House, is one of the primary litigants in our province. He changed the rules of court of evidence and that was ruled to be unconstitutional. He shifted the jurisdiction to the CRT, and that was ruled to be unconstitutional. I do acknowledge that the government has communicated its, its intention to appeal that decision, but the fact remains, the Chief Justice of our courts here in this province has repeatedly ruled the laws that this government has put forward to be unconstitutional. Historically, there has been no other Attorney General that has worn these two unique hats simultaneously. And as I said, there was significant debate in this House about this. The Premier chose to overlook those concerns. I raised those concerns repeatedly. The last time I had that opportunity, in the summer of 2020, the member from Point Grey seemed puzzled as to why I was spending so much time discussing it. But make no mistake, Mr. Speaker, this is not a side issue. It is the primary issue. It is where we must start with every single piece of legislation that this government brings forward to change the way in which ICBC works, because every ICBC-related bill that our Attorney General has touched has been tainted by the underlying conflict that has existed. When each bill was simultaneously being conceptualized, and again, you know, we have a situation where the no-fault regime was being done in parallel. We have an Attorney General that was trying to reform ICBC, but then doing this in the back divided in the way that he was seeing the rights of injured British Columbians. So again, Mr. Speaker, we cannot lose sight of the significance. Essentially, the member from Vancouver Point Grey was asked by the Premier to do two things. Get ICBC's costs down, at least in the manufactured way that they presented, and pass constitutional laws to protect the legal rights of British Columbians. As I mentioned, uh, Mr. Speaker, with his ICBC hat on, the Attorney General came up with the unusual cost-saving plans that require sweeping legislative changes. With his Attorney General hat on, he vetted the legal changes that would be necessary to, in to turn his innovative ideas into reality. Of course, traditionally, Mr. Speaker, those two hats, those two responsibilities would be worn by two different individuals, two different members of the Executive Council. The changes that the member from Vancouver Point Grey brought, put forward may reduce ICBC's costs, but they don't protect the legal rights of British Columbians. In fact, by design, they strip British Columbians of their rights. He was asked by our Premier to do two objectives that are diametrically opposed to one another. He was asked to do a job that is normally for good reason done by two different people. It is no wonder 
that his laws are now being found to be unconstitutional. As I mentioned earlier, when you look at the wasted tax dollars, think about it. This government has created a new state-of-the-art system in addition to the work that the leader of the official opposition did when she was the Attorney General of this province in bringing in place and putting in place the Civil Resolution Tribunal. That was for strata disputes, societal type disputes, not the kind of disputes of the complex nature of brain injuries, concussions, chronic pain, motor vehicle injuries. That was not the initial intention of that CRT. And as I said, Mr. Speaker, when you're defending these constitutional losses and these court challenges, it's not cheap. It can be very expensive, these mistakes that come forward from this government. Well, the member from Point Grey doesn't seem to care about the wasted tax dollars, though. The first thing he had to say to the media about the recent court decision, the loss, is that this will have no impact on ICBC rebates that are coming because it wasn't factored into the cost savings formula to begin with. So, Mr. Speaker, let me just say, though, to pause, the CRT was designed to save on costs by diverting expensive court cases out of litigation, out of the litigation court system, and forcing those same cases into the cheaper online world of the CRT. So one could wonder, Mr. Speaker, how could this not possibly have been factored into the cost savings formula? In any event, when the member for Point Grey makes a statement like that, isn't he essentially saying, don't worry, I predicted this outcome, so I had the foresight not to include it in the formula for calculating rebates? It's almost as if he predicted that the legislation he championed would not withstand judicial scrutiny. The wasted tax dollars are just collateral damage. Well, Mr. Speaker, our Attorney General seems to think that access to a quick decision is more important than access to a fair decision. He has lost sight of what access to justice truly means. In the words of Supreme Court of Canada Justice Russell Brown, quote, access to justice is not merely access to a resolution. After all, many resolutions are unjust. Where a party seeks a rights-based resolution to a dispute, such resolution is just only when it is determined according to the law as discerned and applied by an independent arbitrator. Mr. Speaker, this distinction may be subtle, but it is something that makes one wonder. If the Attorney General wasn't being pulled in two opposing directions, would he have seen the issues more clearly? Well, Mr. Speaker, I just want to turn to uh, the set of regulations that was issued by Order and Council 113 last, fr last Friday, March 5th, 2021. As I mentioned, uh, these uh, regulations, known as the Permanent Impairment Regulation, is to be effective May 1st, 2021. The member from Point Grey has denied this before, and there's a term that is used, uh, that others have used, which is that there is, within ICBC, some form of internal meat chart system. This has been a concern that's been raised for some years now. When I raised this term with the member from Vancouver Point Grey, he took great offense. Well, Mr. Speaker, when you look at the permanent impairment regulation, and I do invite all members of the House to do that, I think when you're looking at this Bill 5, which is short as it is, four pages, 
you should really consider the companion document, the 170, 107 pages of regulations that set out the various forms of injuries, percentage of injuries, percentage of loss, and determines what a British Columbian is entitled to under this new, new no-fault regime. Well, Mr. Speaker, when you look at this set of regulations, it really does appears as a codified version of what is a corporate policy. Essentially, how this works is you go to the schedule, and uh, I don't mean to be insensitive with, with terminology here, but literally it's, it's quite set out very clearly. But you look at the schedule, you pick a body part, and you figure out what it's worth. And it's broken down into two main categories, catastrophic and non-catastrophic injuries. So, Mr. Speaker, let's go to the worst of the worst type of catastrophic injury. And again, I don't want to be insensitive about the nature of these injuries. But the fact of the matter is, when you set it out and, and you know, in the way, in the manner in which this is set out in the regulation, this is what is required under the no-fault regime. This is their version of enhanced care. So if you're rendered a complete quadriplegic, for example, you get just over 264,000 from the meat chart. So the most traumatic and severe accident you can imagine will get you $264,000. Well, Mr. Speaker, what is a complete loss of taste worth? And I mean that in the, in the context of a motor vehicle accident. This one is a non-catastrophic injury, so you start by taking the basic base rate of $167,465, and then you apply it against the percentage value that the schedule allots for this type of injury. The schedule says it's worth 1% of the base rate. So a complete loss of taste is worth $1,674.65. Under this schedule, the loss of a toe is worth the same. A loss of all five toes would get you just over $8,000. If you lost, instead, your entire foot, you'd get just under $42,000. And a lost hand would get you, you $75,000. So again, I do not want to be insensitive in terms of the nature of these types of injuries. But this is the listing, this is what's listed in the 108 pages of the regulation. Mr. Speaker, the government, the Attorney General, the Premier have been characterizing this system, this new system as an innovative enhanced care model, but it doesn't seem to be all that innovative when you look at it. When you look at the details, last summer, Myself and members of this House on the opposition side quizzed the government. The former member from Richmond, Queensboro, the, former, the, the member from Surrey South, myself, about the nature of the no fault bill. And the answers that we got back were the regulations. So much was to be determined by the regulation. And that, Mr. Speaker, is let's just pass this first. This fundamentally changes and takes away the rights of British Columbians and determine everything to follow. At the time when we had that debate, we didn't have these details. What do we have now? We have a four-page bill that purports to talk about fairness. And as the member from Prince George Mackenzie just set out in his speech to this bill, there's really no change in this. There's no greater authority and powers of this fairness officer. In fact, as I'll speak to in a moment in my comments, the independence of the fairness officer is highly questionable, given the nature, the structure of the office and the reporting mechanism. 
the funding and the budget requirements, as well as the powers of the fairness officer itself is quite limited. But as we come back to these regulations, Mr. Speaker, this permanent impairment regulation schedule is very similar to the permanent disability evaluation schedule. And for those who know what the permanent disability evaluation schedule is, well, that's a WorkSafe BC schedule. We've said that when you look at this model, it's very similar. WorkSafe schedule is broken down in much the same way. There are 21 categories. For instance, both documents start out the same, with part one on the subject of upper limbs and part two on the subject of lower limbs. And if you look at risk, wrist and hand amputation, we can see that under ICBC system, you get 45% of the base rate, or WorkSafe BC pays you 54% for the same injury. The loss of taste that we talked about earlier gets you 1% under ICBC system. WorkSafe pays you between 0 to 4% depending on the severity. The worst type of pelvis fracture gets you 2% under ICBC system. Under WorkSafe, it gets you 10%. And an above knee amputation gets you 35 to 40 percent under WorkSafe or under ICBC system, depending on the cut. Under WorkSafe, it gets you 50 percent. We know that there's a lot of trauma involved in injuries, and so I think it's worth mentioning as well that what about a person with a milder psychiatric condition who takes medication and attends counseling less than once per month? that gets you a, a flat 5% from ICBC, whereas WorkSafe would give, pay you 0 to 25%, depending on the severity. Well, Mr. Speaker, I could go on with other examples comparing the two regulations between WorkSafe and this ICBC permanent impairment regulation. But my point is that this is not a new and innovative system at all. Quite frankly, Mr. Speaker, it's simply work safe on wheels. If anyone wants to know what life will be like under this new system with ICBC, they should ask any British Columbian who's had to deal with WorkSafe BC after an injury at work about what their experience was like. To expect that this system will somehow yield a different feedback is naive. This, Mr. Speaker, is what the overall context in which we come to when we look at Bill 5. Because on the surface, as the member from Vancouver Pulse Creek uh, spoke to, it's entitled Fairness Officer. It talks about fairness. It talks about fairness complaints. It talks about something that the, the uh, Minister responsible for ICBC talked about in his second reading speech. You can make recommendations about systemic problems with the fairness of the corporation's processes. You can make recommendations to the corporation to resolve fairness complaints. Well, the problem is, is this fairness officer is really just window dressing for reasons that I'll get to in a moment. When you look at this office, what is most concerning to British Columbians is that this model will be run by the same adjusters who have been working at ICBC for decades. This should be even more concerning since the architect of no fault in these regulations. The Attorney General stood before a press conference on January 29, 2020 and said, in quotes, I think it is no secret that many British Columbians don't trust ICBC. He was right. That is the case. You talk to any British Columbian and they will tell you of their challenges in dealing with ICBC, being denied treatment, being cut off disability benefits, ICBC putting them under surveillance the adjuster ignoring them, and so on. 
So why would the NDP be giving ICBC over to the complete control here? ICBC now, as of May 1st, will have complete control over the lives of injured British Columbians. And what recourse would these injured British Columbians have if ICBC continues in its historical pattern of being unfair to British Columbians? In that same January 2020 press conference, the member from Vancouver Point Grey said, British Columbians should have the peace of mind, well, quote, British Columbians should have the peace of mind they will be treated fairly after they've been injured in a crash, end quote. This is very true. But what is that peace of mind? Well, the NDP said, in quotes, don't worry, we are creating a fairness officer. In quotes, the member said, with this change, British Columbians can have the confidence that the fairness office has greater independence greater independence from ICBC and has the impartial authority to review the fairness of their situation and the ability to make recommendations to ICBC. Well, Mr. Speaker, that sounded like a promising initiative over a year ago, that the NDP would create an independent officer that has the power to make recommendations to ICBC to ensure fairness. Well, let's just see how this played out. A year ago, the member from Vancouver Point Grey said the Fairness Office will be independent from ICBC, which is important. You don't want ICBC overseeing ICBC. Well, Mr. Speaker, you turn to Section 55 sub 3 of Bill 5, and it says that the Lieutenant Governor will appoint the Fairness Officer. And it is the ICBC board that may, in quotes, subject to the approval of the minister, set the terms and conditions of the fairness officer's appointment, including remuneration. So the lieutenant governor will pick the fairness officer, but ICBC will set the terms and conditions of that fairness officer's appointment, meaning they will be able to tell the fairness officer what to do. Even better, the ICBC board will be able to decide how much the fairness officer gets paid. And of course, when we're talking about pay and compensation, you're talking about performance review. You're talking about expectations of the board. The leadership team of ICBC that they would have in the nature of that corporation. Are we running up to time here? Okay. So, uh, noting the hour, I uh, reserve my place in the debate and move adjournment of the debate. Thank you, member. Members participating remotely, have your voting cards ready. Members, you heard the question. The question is the adjournment of the debate. All in favor indicate aye. Aye. Those who oppose indicate nay. Motion carried. Government House Leader. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. I move the House to now adjourn. Again, members, have your voting cards ready. You heard the question. All those in favor indicate aye. Those who oppose, indicate nay. Motion carried. This House stands adjourned until 1.30 this afternoon.